it's, uh, it's impossible to talk about the ecosystem without a discussion of the digital giants and their dominance. And there is no more prolific and poignant voice on this topic than Scott Galloway. If you've missed his fervent commentary on this topic, you, uh, to borrow one of his lines, must be living in a cave in Kandahar. Um, <clears throat> he has literally uh, uh, been uh, everywhere. Um, on, on television, and apparently in all forms. Um, <laughs> by the way, I, I, it's his content, but they got it all wrong. He's way more jacked than that. Uh, but, you know, the notion of using uh, humor to aid substantive points, I don't know. I don't think that's a winner. Um, Scott was a huge hit here two years ago when he literally uh, let the room on fire. Please welcome back to the DMS stage, professor, author, serial entrepreneur with a recent big exit, and friend, Scott Galloway. Thanks, Ross. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Galloway, I teach at NYU, and I appreciate your time. I have 1,500 seconds and 114 slides, so let's light this candle. This is the first and the last slide each of my 6,200 students sees in brand strategy. I don't think you can scale a company beyond 100 million users or $100 billion in value without directly footing to a specific instinct. So in order, our competitive advantage as a species is our brain. It's so large that we're expelled from the body prematurely. It's robust enough to ask very difficult questions, but not robust enough to answer them. As a result, entering into that void have been 3,500 super beings that all compete to be your number one super being. Anybody who has kids has prayed. And a, pray, a prayer is nothing but a query, hoping there's some sort of divine intervention that sees everything and will send you back an answer that you trust more than any priest, rabbi, or scholar. If you have kids, you pray, right? You have your world of stuff, your world of work, your world of sport. Come, something comes off the rails with one of your kids, and the whole world just shrinks to that kid. You know, will my kid be all right? Symptoms and treatment of croup into the Google dialog box. If Google is not your God, or you don't believe it's your God, imagine your face and your name above everything you have typed into that box being made public. You're gonna find out that you, Google knows when you're about to get engaged. It knows when you're thinking about getting divorced. It knows about what ailments you have. It knows what ailments you're worried about having exposed yourself to. And it literally knows the real you. Your therapist, your mom, your friends know a representative of you. Google is our God. Moving further down the torso. One of the wonderful things about our species is we not only need to be loved, kids with poor nutrition and good affection have better outcomes than kids with good affection and poor affection. We need to love others. There's three primary signals of whether or not you'll make it to the fastest growing demographic group, and that's centenarians, in reverse order, genetics. It's less important than we'd like to think. We like to think it's number one so we can treat our bodies like shit and cite Uncle Joe lived till 95. It's number three. If your parents died when they were in their 50s from cancer, the die have not been cast for you as well. Number two, lifestyle. In some, don't smoke, don't be obese, and you screen out about a third of random carcinogenic and cardiac events. But the number one signal or indicator of whether you're going to make it to triple digits is very simple. It's how many people do you love? The physical and mental nuance required in caregiving releases a hormone that clears out the bad cholesterol. When your parents move in with you, your life expectancy goes up two to three years. New mothers do not die. I think initially, Facebook calls on that notion or that need to catalyze and reinforce first and second degree order relationships, and mostly through images, create empathy that fosters love. Moving further down the torso, more. That has been drilled into us since our caveman days. The penalty for too little is the greatest source of death across our species in history, and that's starvation. So the penalty for too little is terrible, probably the worst death in the world, starvation. The penalty for too much is lethargy, diabetes, gluttony, but everything has a 20 or 30 year lag. So open your cupboards, open your closets, and you know you have 10 to 100 times more than you need. You rationally look at your closet and think, I have way more than I need. But that rational thought is immediately washed over with the instinct of, yeah, but I'd really like some more. <laughs> more for less is the business strategy that never goes out of, the, out of style. The country that usually offers the more for less, the best, is the fastest growing economy in the world, and it is today China. The company that does the best job of creating the perception they offer more for less better than anybody is usually the most valuable company in the world, whether it was Walmart in the 90s, or now the company that will be the most valuable company in the world by the end of the year, our first trillion dollar market cap company, 
will be the company offering more for less, and that's Amazon feeding our consumptive gut, moving further down the torso. The strongest instinct. Sir, what is, Dave, what is the strongest instinct? Sex. No, you got fooled. <laughs> if I came at you with a knife, you would not want to kiss me. If you're in an apartment and you're about to get down with someone you're really excited about and you smell smoke, you are leaving the apartment. <laughs> the number one instinct is survival. Everyone in this room got up this morning and you had that box checked. Despite what you see in the Situation Room and reading the newspapers, the likelihood you'll die at the hands of another human being today are the lowest in history until tomorrow. So we have that box checked. So it takes us to our second most powerful instinct, which is sex. And we spend a lot of money and a lot of time making irrational decisions. In the business world, irrational equi equates to margin, which equates to shareholder value. You want to target the organs that are most irrational. Here's a high caloric pace that'll keep your kids alive. That's appealing to the brain, that's rational. Here's a high caloric pace that means you love your kids more. Why? Because choosing moms choose Jif. And the industry that added more shareholder value than any industry to date between 1945 and the introduction of Google took 30 cents of solvents, paste, and soaps and turned it into $3 of emotion, patriotism, European elegance, loving your kids more. That was the CPG industry. Now the industry that has created the most profits in history is targeting the other irrational organs, our reproductive organs, and that is Apple. Apple signals your worth as a mate. This is not a telecom device. This is my attempt to signal to women that if you mate with me, your kids are more likely to survive than if you mate with someone who uses a Discover card or has an Android phone. <laughs> this is, this says you are part of the creative class. It says you are worthy. It says your kids and your offspring will have a lesser chance of infection that if you mate with someone who has a Samsung phone. <laughs> These companies tap into our basic instincts. As a result, they've been able to scale their market cap at unprecedented level, levels. At the, end of, at the end of the Great Recession, the combined market cap of these companies was equivalent to the GDP of Niger. Now it's creeping up on the GDP of Japan and Germany and will likely blow, buy it in the next two years, meaning the only two entities with a greater GDP than the combined market cap, and I want to acknowledge I'm comparing apples to oranges, it's just a metaphor here is going to be China and the US. And I believe these entities combined have more power than any entities on Earth with the exception of China and the US. So let's look at the most valuable companies in 2006. It was a diverse ecosystem, petrochemicals, financial services, conglomerates. Now it's surprisingly homogenous. The five most valuable companies in the world are all big tech. So, and John Battelle is following me here. Uh, John wrote a review on my book. By the way, that's the basis of the book. I go through evolutionary anthropology, trying to connect it to big tech, trying to suss out the pillars of success such you can better invest, better figure out how to start a company, et cetera. John wrote a review of my book, and in the review he said, I got the sense there was a chapter that, that Scott didn't write, and he was absolutely right. And that is, uh, let me come out of the class. I love these companies. Yeah, I was run over by an economic truck in 2008, and I took everything I had and I bought two stocks, Apple and Amazon. Big Tech literally restored economic health to my household. Amazon is the largest recruiter in my class. I have 170 kids on Tuesday nights. 14 of them are headed to Seattle. I work with them, at least until the end of this day. I work with most of them. And they pay me, and people say, do they intimidate you? Do they try and come down on you? Actually, no, the opposite. They've been very supportive, even though they, polite, they politely disagree with what I'm saying. But after studying these companies for two years, really, really trying to understand them, and having worked with them for the better part of a decade directly, I'm entirely convinced that it's time to break these companies up. And I'm gonna go through why, and I'm gonna talk about some arguments that I think are emotional and undermine the legitimate arguments, and then we're gonna talk about the real reason why I think these companies should be broken up. So the first emotional argument, they're evil. They power social, they, they power fake news. Legitimate news sites get 10% of their traffic from social. Illegitimate news sites get almost half their traffic. <laughs> I get in trouble every time I have commentary on this slide, so I'm saying absolutely nothing. But initially, the notion that these platforms had been weaponized was crazy. Then it ended up it was millions of people. And then when an old economy UK paper calls Facebook and says, we think your platforms and the data shared with Cambridge Analytica have been weaponized, it wasn't a thoughtful conversation around help us or we'll help you figure it out. It's a threat of a defamation suit. This is, according to Forbes, the most powerful people in the world. That is ridiculous. The most powerful man in the world is, hands down, Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg oversees a community that's more vast than the population of the Southern Hemisphere if you then add in India. When Castro took over the island nation of Cuba, there were 11 million people. By the way, he was the same age when he took over Cuba that Castro is now. 
Mark Zuckerberg decides the emotion, the sentiment, and the content that a community more vast than Christianity sees, and he can't be removed for 70 years. This is a college dropout who got his career start with a side evaluating women on their physical appearance, screwed over his friends in college, fucked over his best friend right outside of college, and can't be removed for 70 years from the content and influence of 2.1 billion people. What could go wrong? <laughs> history is littered with terrible moments in history, not because only of pure evil or of bad people. Dictators always start benign. They happen because of a lack of checks and balances. If you buy into the American system, you buy into the notion of checks and balances that do not exist at this company. The board of directors, and I've served on dual class board of directors, the board of directors in a dual class shareholder company is not a board of directors. It's a facade of credibility that gets paid a half a million bucks a year to have dinner every three months and offer sage, interesting advice to the one person in control. To give you some sense of the complexion of the mindset of Mark Zuckerberg, last year he proposed to his board that they create a third class of stock such that if he sold his entire economic interest in Facebook, he would still then control the company. In the midst of all this controversy, Facebook decides to launch a gateway drug, Messenger Kids. My kid is more emotionally balanced because of social media, said no parent ever. <laughs> so at conferences like this, I know there's a lot of people from these four firms that come up here. I want to help you decipher what they really mean when they say certain, certain things. So here are some definitions across some of the things you're going to hear today and what these people really mean. When they say platform, when they use the term platform, what they really mean is we're a media company, we want to operate in a netherland of unprecedented multiples and no accountability. <laughs> when they say it would be impossible for us to screen our content, or we have too much respect for the First Amendment, or we don't want to be arbiters of truth, what they mean is screening our content would be unprofitable. I served on the board of the New York Times for two years. We could look every advertiser in the eyes and say we guarantee you we will not be weaponized by a foreign actor trying to subterfuge our democracy. We were able to do that with $200 million in free cash flow, but Facebook can't do it with $20 billion in free cash flow? That is total bullshit. We're talking about the realm of the profitable, not the realm of the possible. And unprofitable in the eyes of big tech translates to impossible. Innovation at conferences like this typically means elegant theft. Theft of your data, figuring out a way to call drivers, driver partners, so 12,000 people can, spill, can split $80 billion of value approaching Airbus, but we can take our 2.1 million driver partners and figure out a way to pay them less than minimum wage and not give them health insurance or benefits, because they're our driver partners. We want to give voice to the unheard. That's the one you hear a lot from Facebook, when they don't want to take down content that might be, who knows? responsible for driving ethnic cleansing and other things like that. That means we know we're wrong and have no intention of doing anything about it. And they might as well have t-shirts at this point printed up that say, we need to do better. We need to do better. A lot of earnest people looking at the people that I mean, we need to do better. That also means we know we're wrong and have no intention of doing anything about it. 50 million people got their data hacked. No, it was 87 million. The only thing we know about these hacks is they're going to get worse. When's the last time you heard? You know what? The hack wasn't as bad as everyone thought. Never has that happened. Whose fault is this? Is this their fault? Are they evil? No, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They're for-profit companies developing economic security for their stakeholders. The people at fault here are the man in the mirror. It's the citizenry that refuses to elect officials to hold these companies to the same scrutiny that they hold every other company. What are we telling these companies vis-a-vis -vis our elected officials? Facebook lies and says, if you've approved a transaction, EU, of WhatsApp, it would be impossible for us to share the data between the WhatsApp platform and Facebook. Europe is understandably worried about lists and information and said, we don't like the idea of you sharing this content. It would be impossible for us to share the data. OK, they approve it. Spoiler alert, 90 days later, they figure it out. And the EU says, we feel lied to. We're going to find you 122 million bucks. That's 0.6% of the $19 billion acquisition price. If you as a CEO could take out an insurance policy for 0.6% to make sure the transaction went through called lying, wouldn't you take that insurance policy? 
Google keeps signing to consent decrees saying we will not send people to the place we can monetize, we'll continue to send them to the best place, and they keep violating that consent decree. And Europe gets angry and says, that's it, we're really pissed off this time, we're finding you $3 billion, which is equivalent to 3% of their cash on hand, their stock went up the day that fine was announced. If you had a parking spot in front of your house that was metered and it was 100 bucks every 15 minutes, but the ticket for not complying with that meter was 25 cents, what would you do? You'd break the law. And that's what these companies will continue to do until we grow a pair and start regulating them the same way we regulate every other company in this room. Amazon can now go shopping on other people's credit cards. They announce an acquisition and the markets reward them with additional market cap, almost equivalent to the size of the acquisition, and force their competitors to pay for the acquisition by taking their market cap down greater than the cost of the acquisition. The largest pure play grocery in America shed a third of its value in between the time Amazon announced the acquisition of Whole Foods, a grocer won 11th the size of Kroger, and when they closed. Amazon's about to become the only entity in the world, maybe the exception of the police, that can get into your house without your permission. Think about that. One entity, the police need a search warrant. With your permission granted, you'll give them your permission, they're gonna be able to come into your room in your closet. They're clearly lining up zero click ordering where you won't even need to unpack anything. So let's talk about Amazon. 44% of US households own a gun, 49% own a landline phone, and 51% of US households attend church monthly. I think these are the same people. <laughs> That's a geography pet test. Big laugh on the coast in London. I was in Bentonville last week, not a lot of laughter. <laughs> 55% over 50K, 55% voted in the election, 64% of US households have Prime, 78% decorated a Christmas tree, and the only consumer that matters right now, the wealthy consumers, they're the ones capturing all the incremental income gains, 82% of wealthy households have a cable pipe of stuff called Amazon. The notion that we should restrain AT&T's acquisition of Time Warner is insane. 130 million distribution, Time Warner, great content. Well, hold on, Amazon has distribution with two-thirds of households and is the second largest spender on original content, but AT&T needs to sell the Cartoon Network. Android has the largest TV network, YouTube, installed on two billion devices, but Time Warner needs to sell Adult Swim. One of two things is happening here. Either the call to restrain AT&T Time Warner is ridiculous, or we should have broken up these companies 10 years ago. Amazon now gains or loses the value of FedEx in a day. The total perversion of our society in the hands of big tech is epitomized with what I would call this total shit show circus called HQ2, where Chicago has basically said, we give up. Amazon, if you locate here, you can tax your employees and you can decide how those municipal funds are sent. The government of Chicago has basically said to Amazon, we give up, you're now the government. By the way, HQ2 will be Washington, D.C. No one's going to regulate the kid throwing out the first pitch at the Washington Nationals game, which is going to be Jeff Bezos. The other 19 cities have been played. <laughs> Amazon says we're only 4% of retail. Don't regulate us. That's a number. Here's some other numbers. A quarter of all retail growth, a third of all cloud revenue, 44% of e-commerce sales, 55% of Black Friday, two-thirds of households, 70% share of voice. 30% of all computing is going to be done via voice in two years. That means a retail company is going to control 20% of all computing in the next 24 months. And again, 82% of households. Let's talk about Google. 92% market share of a market by dollar volume that's greater than the entire ad market of any nation in the world. And it's going to pass the US. If one company in the US controlled 90% of all corporate messaging, would we be down with that? That's where Google is right now. Let's talk about Facebook. Uh, Terry talked about the duopoly. This isn't a communications vehicle, it's a delivery device for Facebook. What if the four largest retailers in the nation, Walmart, Home Depot, Kroger's, and CVS, every morning met and said, we're gonna put all our resources and intellect to try and put number five, Target, out of business. What would happen? Target would go out of business. And that's what is happening with Snap, which is now The Walking Dead. Because the four biggest apps in the world every morning get up and say, how can we put Snap out of business? I'm convinced the next version of Instagram is just going to be called Snap. <laughs> within 48 hours, within 48 hours of any feature being released on Snap, Facebook integrates it into all their properties, even where it doesn't make sense. We were all hoping that Snap would be the Facebook of video. The Facebook of video is Instagram stories. This is the scariest thing that happened in 17. This is Senator Richard Byrne closing the Senate intelligence hearings where Facebook, Google, and Twitter uh, testified. 
Don't let nation states disrupt our future. And you're the front line of defense for it. Please take that back to your companies. This hearing is adjourned. The guy who has confidential hearings with the Joint Chiefs of Staffs, approves kill lists from the CIA, has decided that Facebook, Twitter, and Google are our front lines of defense. Well, collectively, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say, fuck that. <laughs> this is my front lines of defense. Of those 6,200 students I've taught, 117 are young men and women from the Army, the Navy, Air Force, and Marines. I know them well. Trust me on this. You would rather them being your front lines of defense than the Zuck. <laughs> why are we so angry? And I think a fair question would be, no, Scott, why are you so angry? <laughs> We've come to expect that technology plays a role in the betterment of humanity. 1942, we get 100,000 of the best and brightest, put them in the Southwest and say we're in a foot race with Hitler to split the atom, and it literally, we need to save the world. And we did. Technology helped save the world. In 1942, my mother was a four-year-old Jew sleeping in the tube in London because her house had been bombed in the Blitzkrieg, and they passed out gas masks in the form of Disney characters so the kids wouldn't be scared to put them on if there was an alarm saying, gas attack. I mean, you think you have problems? Think about the failure you would, you, my, my grandparents must have felt, taking their kids to sleep in a bomb shelter. I mean, just amazing. And she was saved by a strip of ocean called the British Channel. The brains, the brawn, and the blood of the British, the Americans, and the Russians, and technology. I'm here because of technology. We got the band back together 25 years later, 400,000 of our best and brightest Canadians, Brits, and Americans, and said, we're going to accomplish the impossible, send a, a projectile up, time it such that it lands on a rock. We don't even know what the substances we're going to be landing on, and we're going to bring these men home safely. And we have effectively accomplished the most significant accomplishment in history. Speaking about tech. OK, so what have these guys been brought together? 700,000 people playing with lasers, the greatest concentration of capital, creativity, and humanity ever assembled. And after studying these companies for a long time, I'm convinced that the singular objective is pretty simple. It's not to create comity of man or solve world hunger. It's to sell another Nissan. And I think we feel let down. And I think we're angry. Now, a fair question is, should we expect more from these companies than we expect from everyone else? That's a fair question. But for some reason, we do. Do they avoid taxes? This is Tim Cook. We not only comply with the laws, but we comply with the spirit of the laws. No, not really. The spirit of US tax law isn't that you issue the IP to an isle off the British coast such that they can charge high tax domains billions of dollars to use that IP, suppressing taxes in a high tax domain and inflating taxes in a low tax domain. This is the European headquarters of Apple that has now the cash equivalent to the GDP of Denmark. And they've paid effectively a tax rate on this cash of 4%. What's your tax rate? Amazon, I apologize for the fonts here. Amazon, or Walmart since the Great Russian Recession, has paid $64 billion in corporate income tax. Amazon has paid $1.4 billion. What does it mean when the most successful company in the world doesn't pay corporate income tax? It means the less successful companies have to pay more. We've institutionalized a regressive corporate income tax. Alexa, is this a good thing? <laughs> this despite the fact that Amazon added the entire value of Walmart in one quarter last year and has paid about 3% of the taxes. They destroy jobs. OK, they're going to add $28 billion in incremental growth. They'll need another 26,000 people. Traditional media, this is a zero-sum game. Traditional media is getting the crap kicked out of it. They're hemorrhaging jobs. They're not as efficient. They need 233,000 people. So loosely speaking, we have net job destruction of creative directors, copywriters, agency planners of about 200,000 people a year, of four Yankee stadiums of friends at media planners and ad agencies who are going to decide to spend more time with their families every January 1. I think all of these are decent arguments and worthy of a conversation. But I think the real reason we break these guys up is because we're capitalists. So capitalism, you need private property, wage labor, voluntary exchange, price system. And you, most importantly, you need competitive markets. And these markets are no longer competitive. These companies are taking advantage of their immense portal power to crush small companies and put big companies that are traditionally better employers to prematurely euthanize them. What's good for Amazon is bad for the rest of a sector that's the third largest employee in America, retail. When they say they've announced a great holiday, everybody else goes down. Amazon can now perform Jedi mind tricks and put out a press release saying that they're thinking about the healthcare industry. No detail whatsoever. 
And on the opening bell the next morning, the healthcare industry sheds $31 billion in value. I think Amazon could take the value of any company down 30% in 30 days with 30 press releases. So when you can begin damaging competition and putting your, your foot on the windpipe of the mother's milk of business, which is capital, without even making any investments yourself, it means the markets are failing. Key to robust markets is that no one player or individual has too much power, and we have blown by that with Amazon. This is where we were with these companies when we broke them up. And by the way, I don't think they've done anything wrong. I don't think they're evil. A natural part of the economic cycle is occasionally we step in and we break companies up. This is where we are with these firms. Looks familiar? We're at that level of concentration. So in order to do this, we're going to have to get rid of the macho test. I was one of the 90% of New Yorkers that voted for Hillary Clinton. I was totally flummoxed by the result. And I said, I need to get out and understand red states more. So the way I get out and touch red states more is I go on Fox once a week. <laughs> and it's clear that people see regulation and breaking up and trust busting is wimpy. You're a wimpy New York professor. You need to be macho like me and say, don't break them up. We like to compete. That's American. That's testosterone. Or worse, it's not even socialism. It's worse than that. It's European, right? <laughs> this is how I am introduced on Fox now after I call for the breakup of big tech. He's a socialist, but we'll have him on the show. You're a socialist. You are a socialist, are you not? Can you turn it up, please? You're an interesting guy because you're a socialist. <laughs> Stern professor of business, Scott Galloway, frequent guest on the program, and a, an all-round good guy, despite his socialist past, <laughs> is with us this morning. Every time on Fox, they introduce me as a socialist now. <laughs> so ask me this, or answer me this. If the DOJ had moved in on Microsoft in 99 and said, stop killing small companies like Netscape, would the object of everyone's affection, Google, be here? Do you think Microsoft would have let Google happen? had the DOJ not been watching them and shot a flare across their bow. So the $750 billion object of every innovator's affection is here because of regulatory intervention. So some final words. I think the purpose of an economy is to create a middle class. At some point, we've got to connect the dots here and see the rise of big tech is correlated with the decline in middle class wages. Our middle class is failing. It's not going to be easy to break these guys up. They're smarter than us. Bezos has 88 full-time lobbyists already in D.C. He's going to put his headquarters in D.C. He purchased the most liberal newspaper. What an incredible prophylactic to pretend to be a good person worried about liberal values. All these firms wrap themselves in a neon pink, blue, or rainbow blanket, which is the ultimate illusionist trick for a company that acts like Darth Vader and Ayn Rand during the day. Oh, they didn't sell their stake in Business Insider, even though it was bought, and now they have an illiquid stub. I wonder why you'd want influence at the fastest growing online business publication. I think every business issue and most societal issues can be solved with a saying from Star Wars. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing that Darth Vader asked his son to do. And I have video here. You know it to be true. So put aside your gag reflex around capitalism and competitiveness. I start companies. I'm not afraid to compete with anybody. And I've had exits. I know what it's like to be a capitalist. I've embraced it, you know, heart and soul, full-throated capitalist. But imagine two ecosystems. One is the one we have, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Now imagine another ecosystem, Amazon AWS, Amazon Fulfillment, Apple, iTunes, YouTube, Google Cloud, Google, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger. All separate companies with separate shareholder structures. Which ecosystem has more hiring? Which ecosystem has a broader tax, tax base? Which ecosystem has more VC-backed companies? Which ecosystem has more M&A? So we don't break these guys up because they're evil. That's bullshit. There's a bunch of them here. They're no more or less evil than any of us. We don't break them up because they avoid taxes. We all avoid taxes. We don't even break them up because they destroy jobs. Manufacturers destroy people, destroy jobs in the farming society. Services destroyed manufacturing. We need job destroyers. There's another word for that. It's called innovation. We break these guys up because we are capitalists, and it's time to oxygenate 